sometime in his life uh, prepares a message and then when he thinks he's got it all in shape the Lord says no well I had that experience I, I intended to go straight into the issue of prayer or the prayer life I want to speak about a prayer tonight that maybe you've never heard anyone preach on but next week I hope to go right into the the story of the man who prayed just twice and then the week after and then the week after that's unless you all get frightened tonight <coughs> I believe this is the most critical hour in not just American history but world history on the theological level when that uh, pestiferous man called Martin Luther was waging war, he waged war just against the Roman Church. He thought it was number one in heresy, which I still think. But now we've not only got Mormonism, we've not only got uh, Catholicism, we've got Mormonism, we've got Russellism, we've got Moonism, and we've got Humanism. I do not believe but the moral desolation in America, or even England, the moral desolation in America and the spiritual stagnation is not, N-O-T, is not due to the strength of humanism, but to the weakness of evangelism. I believe the number one enemy to revival in America today <coughs> is evangelism. One of the most famous preachers in the world I have a few, like Brother Bracey, he comes to see me sometimes. This famous man came and I said to him, in America today we have at least 500 evangelists. We do not have one revivalist. The last revivalist, as far as I know, <coughs> in America was a Baptist, and I, I, unless you're very old you won't remember him, by the name of, what was his name? I tell my class sometimes that uh, I'm not losing my, mem my mind, I'm just losing my memory now and again. Pardon? Mordecai Ham, good. Do you ever hear him? Oh, you heard of him. A lady won't say she heard him. It makes <coughs> It dates them, you see. But I, uh, a few, I haven't been on the road preaching for about three years. I've been in trouble physically in the last four years. I've had three strokes, two heart attacks, and uh, still more to come. It, it, you can be sure of this. If you enter the enemy's territory, you'll fight back in, on, on many different levels. But after preaching one night, a brother came to me the next morning, and he said, you know, last night you reminded me so much of Mordecai Ham. I said, well, that's a compliment. I said, did you hear him? He said, yes. If he came to a town, say like Kilgore, <coughs> he brought a tent holding maybe 600, which was considered large at that time. And, uh, and he said, the third night of preaching, he had to have a police escort to get him into the pulpit and a police escort to get him out. He troubled earth and hell. But when he left, taverns closed and never opened again. Danfolds closed, never opened again. We don't have a preacher in the country that can preach like that today. In fact, I said to this famous man, and everybody knows his name around the world, nearly. I said, there is no biblical foundation for going for a one-night stand in any city. Supposing the Apostle Paul had done that. Supposing Finney had done that. There's no such thing known in the scripture. It, it's maybe an American phenomenon. The number one need in America today, as you know, or in the world, is a real Holy Ghost revival. Amen. There are three kinds of people in the world. Number one, those who are afraid. Number two, those who don't know enough to be afraid. And number three, those who know their Bibles. 
I could withdraw that and say there are only two kinds of people in the world. Number one, those who are dead in trespasses and in sin. And number two, those who are dead to sin. There's no middle course. Dead in trespasses and in sin or dead to sin. My text tonight is provided by a woman. You find it in the book of Judges. <coughs> Sorry. Judges chapter 16. And verse 6. I'm reading from the Living Bible, the King James Version. If I didn't say that to you, Spencer and I just shouted it out. <laughs> Verse 6, Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein the, thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. Again, that's a question of a woman to a man of God. What's the secret of your great strength? I would to God the world was asking the church that tonight. She figures we have no strength. Before he retired, I don't know when that was, but when did uh, Carl F. Henry retire as the... Well, he founded, he was a founder editor of Christianity Today. And before he retired, he said he sent out a questionnaire uh, to, uh, I forget how many, 300 preachers, and asked them a simple question. Say, this is 20 years ago, what do you see for the Church of Christ by the year 2000? I've forgotten... Most of the answers, I remember there's a very good answer by Leighton Ford, Billy Graham's brother-in-law. <coughs> there's another by Elton Trueblood, the, philo the Quaker philosopher. And he said, by the year 2000, the Church of Jesus Christ will be a conscious minority surrounded by an arrogant, militant paganism. But that's where it is tonight. A shrinking minority surrounded by an arrogant, militant paganism. The world, the flesh, and the devil, and the press are against the Church of Jesus Christ today. This is the most critical hour. And the trouble with so many Christians, they're more troubled with who's in the White House than who's in God's house. We go to the house of God. We read the Word of God. We sing praises to God, but where is God? When did you last tip to out of the sanctuary, awed by the majesty of God's holiness? <coughs> a very popular periodical a few years ago, uh, a few months ago, here in America, took a, uh, a what do you call it, a poll across the nation as to uh, what's your greatest fear? I don't know the rotation exactly, but it was something like this. Number one, I fear an invasion from Russia. Number two, I fear an atomic war. Number three, I fear an economic collapse. Number four, five, I fear cancer. Number six, I fear an ac I travel much, I fear an accident. <laughs> Leaving me with a mangled body the rest of my life. Do you know that one person feared God? Jimmy Swaggart says the reason for this, what I call moral desolation and spiritual stagnation, is due to the fact that preachers have lost sight of the, of the rapture. I don't believe that for one split second. You've got people Sunday who are standing and singing in church. What if it were today and they were planning divorce tomorrow? Are you going to try and persuade me that they believe in a momentary rapture? There's millions of people believe in, in Jesus coming instantly, but they skip prayer meeting every Wednesday night. Well, people alert for God don't do that. The problem is not that we've lost sight of the rapture. The problem is we've lost sight of the judgment seat. I'm trying to write a book on that. I've, if you pardon the phrase, I've been, phrase, I've been pregnant with a thing for 10 years. And I should have finished it last year. But if I had, I'd have... I, I'd have lost so much of the book. That's why the Lord didn't let me have it. 
It's the most awesome thing that's coming. That you individually, whether you're a saint or a sinner, you have to stand personally there up before the judgment seat. No longer gentle Jesus, meek and mild. We like to sing that the famous hymn of wrestlers. Uh, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But he also wrote the hymn, Lo, he comes with clouds descending. Once the favored sin of flame. Thousands, thousands saints attending throughout the town. Every eye shall now behold him clothed in dreadful majesty. Those who set up not and pierced him, deeply wailing on the tree, they're going to stand before him too. Pontius Pilate, Herod's going to stand there. He doesn't know a word about it. His priest or his pope won't tell him. Kennedy, Teddy Kennedy's going to stand there and have to explain the death of that woman in that car with him. Everybody's going to stand at it. Not, not a single person is going to get by. It's the most awful event that's yet to come. When all the people, all the nations of the earth are coming to the great white throne judgment, all believers are coming to the judgment seat, which we call again the uh, Bema seat. Now let me go back a, a minute there. <coughs> uh, okay. I'll pick up here, any. Try and cut some out. You won't want to stay till midnight, I suppose. <laughs> uh, the first story I heard about uh, America was in England, if you don't know. And uh, it was a story about a very famous person who never lived here, Rip Van Winkle. Come on, you smart people, who wrote that story? Who wrote the story of Rip Van Winkle? Nobody knows. Good for you. You went to school. <coughs> Washington Irving wrote it, that's right. He also wrote Little Off Nanny, didn't he? Oh, you, you didn't know. You're not so educated. I anticipated too much. Anyhow, the story, as I heard it from my teacher, you know, my teacher had a real, uh, what was I going to say? complex and she was very dull she thought I was dumb and I thought the same thing about her <laughs> <laughs> but she told me the story about Rip Van Winkle he went up the Hudson I remember going up there years ago and he went to a place you remember called Sleepy Hollow and uh, he fell asleep and he slept well whether you get the authorized version or revised, it makes all the difference in the world. Some say he slept a year, some say he slept 20 years, some say he slept 100. And that's all I ever learned about the story. And that isn't the story at all. When he went up the hill, there was a sign outside of the tavern. And there it was, uh, well, like my Bible. It was swinging in the wind. And on it, it had the face of George III painted. Well, he went to sleep. And when he went down the hill, he found a, a bunch of people arguing. And he got involved in the argument. And he forgot to look at the sign because they'd rubbed out the face of George III and they'd painted the face of another George there who was partly English by the name of George Washington. And the point is not that he slept 10 years or 20 years, the point is he slept through a revolution. And that's what the church is doing tonight. People say, oh, I get phone calls all over the country. I'm going to live in this city. I'm going to live there. Can you tell me a church that's really burning for God? No, I can't. Oh, the church is dead. Jesus never said the church is dead. He said something worse than that. He describes it in Revelation 3, doesn't he? He says of his own church, she's poor and wretched and naked and blind and miserable. That's what he says, not what the press say. He says of the Laodicean church, and you know, guys argue about pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. But they all seem to agree this is the Laodicean period. And it sure is. And the church is blind. She's blind to the judgment seat. She's blind to five billion people lost without God and without hope. She's blind to her own individual responsibility. The church is sleeping. She's sleeping through the greatest revolution. 
Did you ever dream in your lifetime that gay people, that's a rotten name, gay, for the leprous disease that they have? Did you ever dream that they'd march down Main Street claiming their rights? Would you ever dream that some churches are actually uh, giving ordination to homosexuals? You couldn't have dreamed that in a thousand years. But we have it now. Wilkinson sent a bunch of his people a few years ago to a metropolitan church in, uh, in Dallas. And he was staggered. When they went in, they gave him a brochure with, of naked men inside. And it gave them contacts they could make gay bars to go to. This was a church. And the preacher said, well, go home now, enjoy. Well, I know you speak in tongues. Speak in tongues. Go home, enjoy yourself, and enjoy your partner tonight. God has made us free. And this is a presentation of the so-called gospel. You know there are more slaves in America or England tonight than ever have been in history? Voluntary slaves to sexual perversion, slaves to nicotine, slaves to drink, slaves to TV, some of you preacher boys. You don't pray through the night like the old Pentecostals are you watching TV till you're stupid. If you'd like to know my birthday, I'll tell you, the 18th of June. But on the 18th of June, in 1845, that, that, that's not when I was born, that's just a day. <laughs> 18th of June, 1845, Napoleon fought a, a very decisive battle. He had, uh, he had squashed a lot of other nations round about him, and he was going into battle, and on the wall, he had a great map of, of Europe. <coughs> and uh, the officers were not being attentive so he snapped them to attention and of course when he did that they thought he'd be angry and he, he had a volcanic uh, temper <coughs> and he looked at the map and he, he, he mentioned various countries then he put his finger on a little red spot which happened to be England and he made this statement. He said, there lies a sleeping giant. You've heard that phrase often enough. There lies a sleeping giant, he said. Let it sleep. Because he said, if that country ever wake, no, pardon me. He had talked to them about England. And then he went to China, which right now has, what, a thousand million people, a fifth of the world's uh, human family. He ran his finger around the ragged edge of the country and he said, they're like, and plunged his finger in the center. And he said, that's China, a sleeping giant. Let it sleep. If it ever marshals its mineral power to its manpower and gets on the move, it will shake the world. Well, instead of seeing Napoleon, see the devil. And he comes to the church of Jesus Christ and he runs his finger around it. And he says, the church of Jesus Christ is asleep. Let it sleep. Because if it ever discovers the power of the Holy Ghost, it will ransack this world. We've got shibboleths. We talk about the Holy Ghost. We hardly know that much about him. I believe that through Pentecostal message, and you know, I'll say this, you may not let me back. You know, Pentecostals hang on very tenaciously to Acts 1-8, you shall receive power. And they hang with the same tenacity on to Acts 2-4 and the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues that's all right but be consistent consistency is a rare jewel why not hold on to Acts 6 for your deacons could you learn the deacons of any of your churches up and say these men are full of faith of the Holy Ghost and they do signs and wonders and miracles Amen. could you go into the 8th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles the people say sometimes there's no revival it's mentioned no revival it's mentioned in the uh, in the New Testament no but it's implied because Paul says in the 21st chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, he took a party of people and he says, we stayed in the house of Philip, the evangelist. It's the same Philip mentioned in Acts 6. And Philip didn't go with an invading party, God help us. He didn't put on a million dollar crusade. Gentlemen, if you forget everything, remember this, Mr. Chadwick, our blessed president, put this in my mind, 
50 years ago, I went to school in 30, 31, for, for seven, months, seven months. And he used to say to us, gentlemen, you never have to advertise a fire. When you advertise, it's a sign God isn't there. When God was there, there was a shaft of fire over the temple, over the tabernacle. It wasn't a million dollar building, it was made of badger skins and all kinds of junk. But the presence of God was there. And when the fire wasn't there, there was a pillar of cloud there. But where's the fire now? People say, have you had the baptism? Oh, that's a terrible thing to say. Ask them, are you baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire? Did he come and burn up your selfishness, burn up your pride, burn up your uncleanness? Did he purify you? You see, the weakness of modern Pentecostal isn't the stress is all on power and not on purity. But everything in the Old Testament had to be pure. The lamps, they had oil. No, they had pure olive oil. The desk was made of gold. No, it was made of pure gold. The garments of the priest must not have any linen, uh, any wool in them, only linen. Do you know why? Because wool makes you sweat. And that's the only thing the preachers have brought from that day to this. They refuse to sweat. And I'll tell you when the fire of the Holy Ghost, I told somebody today, you know, the last few months, I feel as though I've got a volcano inside of me. I'll tell you how to get into shape. Maybe you need to kick the TV out. I go to bed between nine and half past at night. I get up at midnight and stay in my office two or three hours or longer, whatever God wants. You see, with all the money in the world, you can't buy more time. Preachers don't usually have enough money to waste, but they waste a lot of time. And if you love this man of God, and I love him, and he is a man of God, deacons do your job, visit the sick, visit the hospitals, take care of the poor, leave him time to pray. Any Baptist preachers here, let me see your hands. Good for you. Wonderful, how dare you stray in this place? Do you know when, when Alexander McLaren went to, went to uh, Manchester and I, I had the privilege of having a meeting in his church, it's a, it's, it held, holds over 2,000 people, and he met the deacons, bearded old guys, and they told him this and that and the other, and they said, will you accept our offer? This is the wage, we'll buy you a new carriage and horse, or horses, we'll get you a new house, and they went down the list of things. You, yeah, I'll accept it. Oh, thank you. Just a minute. He said, if you accept my conditions. What? You see, the deacons thought they were hiring a donkey. <coughs> you got conditions? Yes. He said, look, gentlemen, and he stood at the side away from the table, he said, you can have my feet or my head, but not both. If you do the visiting, go to hospitals, care for the sick and do everything else, I'll guarantee I'll spend all my time with my head and my heart in the Word of God he did. And so you can buy his expositions now. Alexander McLaren's about as good as anybody. And he preached right through the word of God there. Because he had one thing to do. You see, the secret of the Apostle Paul is this. This one thing I do. Dear Lord, he went to heaven for a vacation. He'd have been on TV every day for a year, wouldn't he? Yeah. He'd have written six books on it. How I went up and how I came down. <laughs> and yet he says nothing about it. You see, the, why, why I'm happy I'm here tonight, if I, if I did as others say, I've been six other uh, different countries. I'm here tonight because I believe I'm in God's will, that's why. God. If the offering's only $10,000, it will help, but uh, <laughs> <coughs> every penny of it will go to the mission field. I don't take a dime. I'll tell you a miracle. I've got two sons, both Pentecostal preachers. One has just retired, uh, resigned from a church 1,500 Sunday mornings with 500 simultaneously in Sunday school and he set off preaching around the world without any financial backing. My other son has been down in Paraguay. He's been in Argentina and Paraguay about 25 years, never once asked for a penny. I never asked for a dime. Got my boys through school, college, university and God has met every bill. And all I owe is something to General Motors, but they can wait. Pay the rest on my, on my car. <laughs> Did somebody say you'll do it? Okay. <coughs> no. We see the devil is, is terribly afraid of the church of Jesus Christ and nothing else. 
He's afraid of anointed men. He's afraid of men who walk with God. So the world is asking this man, you see, you can say three things about Samson. You can think of his own life, it began miraculously, it fell down in the middle, and it finished in greater triumph than it began. It's a picture of Israel. She began with the supernatural. I, I'll ask Brother Bracey after, you know, in Aaron's, no, what was it, in the ark, what did they put in the ark, Brother Bracey, I've forgotten now. The ark of the covenant. Uh, they put the uh, tablets. The tablets, the t Ten Commandments. Yeah, have who? Well, that's the point. <laughs> I wonder why they didn't make a, a, a relic of, of Moses. Uh, when he, what, what did he do? He took out his rod and divided the sea. But they weren't after uh, worshipping a thing like that. The Ten Commandments were there. Remember again, a, sorry, a smart American. There are some smart Americans, you know. And a smart American preacher said years ago, they're not ten suggestions, they're ten commandments. You can run any country in the world on the ten commandments and no country in the world without them. And they've got to come back. Boy, we've sung amazing grace till we're stupid. It's time to bring the law back as well as grace and have a balance. <coughs> well, here's a man moving in the, in the realm of the supernatural all the time. And I don't care whether it's a denomination or an individual church. If it hasn't the supernatural, it has a superficial. And you see, the great tragedy, you're going to learn a lot tonight. Do you know why the, re the world was in the mess it's in? Because we exported American Christianity and British Christianity, not Bible Christianity. We went to China with, with, a, with a set of laws that we'd learned in school and all we did was give lectures about the Bible while they were giving lectures about Confucius. And you can't fight that. You've got to have life. Not just lectures, not just uh, intellectualism. Well, this man's moving anyhow in the power of the Spirit. And so what did he do? He was a terror to evildoers. They were afraid of him. So it says in verse 5, the lords of the Philistines came to this woman Delilah, entice him. Then verse 6, Delilah said to Samson, tell me, I pray thee, where in thy great strength lieth, and where, where, where with thou mightest be bound to faith. Listen to his answer. It's awesome. Where with thou mightest be bound to faith. Verse 7, Samson said unto her, to her, if they bind me with seven green withs that were never dried, then shall I be weak. Dear God, that's bad enough, but listen, I should be weak like other men. He knew it was abnormal, she knew it was abnormal, and his enemies knew abnormal. But the last thing America's afraid of is the Church of Jesus Christ. We're far more concerned getting a man in the, in the White House than getting the right man in God's house. And politics are sunk, they've had their day. This is the greatest opportunity that has been for a century in America. Let men of God arise in the power of the Spirit and forget the devil and the deacons and anybody else. And say, listen, I'm going to preach God's word, come hell or high water. Amen. And the world again will begin to say, what's the secret of that church down there? Why do people flock to it? There's a book out right now called Seven Pentecostal. Is it Se Pioneers. Seven Pentecostal Pioneers? Read it. The middle story is about Stephen Jeffries, a little Welshman. He came 50 miles from my home. He rented a building holding 2,000. By the end of the week, they turned 1,000 a night away. Do you know what he says? Read the story. Two weeks he was there, 924 people went through the inquiry room and were dealt with personally. I told the popular evangelist in my office, I said, blast away as much as you like against abortion. But I said, you, you evangelists are abortionists. You bring a, a crowd of young people to the front, and all they do is just about say, God be merciful to me, a sinner go back. I said, listen, the woman that ab aborted that baby is going to see that baby's face at the judgment seat, and the baby's going to... The woman that ab aborted that baby is going to see that baby's face at the judgment seat, 
and the baby's going to see its mother's face for the first time and you're going to see everybody that you came to the altar and let them go away. They were damned when they came, they were damned when they left. The new birth is a miracle. The great revivalists had a back room where people went. Sure it took till two or three o'clock in the morning to see them through. But this is a supreme miracle. It's greater than a baby being born. It takes all the redemptive power of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Ghost, and the power of the Father to forgive. And yet we turn to get them to nod their head, and off they go. <coughs> then shall I be weak as other men. Do you know what I'm sick of, dear brother Bracey? In the church of Jesus Christ, even amongst the priests, I'm sick of mediocrity. I'm tired of living, living amongst dwarfs. Where are the towering men that the Baptists used to have, like A.B. Earl? After he was born again, he received an experience of being filled with the Holy Ghost, so the Baptists don't quote him. But he went to cities and they shook under the power of God. There were no signs and wonders and miracles. In the Welsh revival, there was no physical manifestation. What happened? The Holy Ghost came and they were crazy about soccer. The soccer stadiums were empty. The taverns were empty. Uh, the, the dance halls were empty. But listen, there's a price. The little fellow that God used in the Welsh Revival was Stephen Jeffreys. He was 26 years of age when God opened the heavens on him. But the record says he, pre he had prayed for 13 years. What's your 13-year-old doing? You're leading him to hell? He, he reads, sees anything he wants on TV? And things he doesn't want to see? And there he watches his stupid father. Daddy's so full of sport, and the kid's full of sport. The greatest thing my daddy ever did for me, he took me to a half night of prayer when I was 14 years of age. When I saw my big strong daddy take his coat off, about two in the morning, his shirt stuck to his back with wrestling in prayer. And two other men, boy, once I'd been there, I was ruined forever for entertainment. And you see, entertainment is the devil's substitute for joy. The church that has the less joy has the best entertainment program. Oh, it's the only way to draw young people. It sure is not. When the Holy Ghost is resident, you've no trouble keeping young people. Yes. They are silenced in the presence of the eternal God. We're afraid of silence today. Everything as soon as you get in is clap your hands and all the rest of it. And God is... I'll, I'll, I'll speak about that next week, partly. Tell me where in thy great strength. Well, what she say? Bind me with seven green withs that were never dried. Then I, sh I shall be weak as another man. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, he said, If they bind me fast with new robes, were never occupied, I shall be weak and be as another man. That's two warnings. Look at verse 17. He told her all his heart and said unto her, There is not a razor come upon my head. If I be shaven, then will my strength go from me, and I shall become weak like any other man. Can you think of a man being warned three times and walking into the trap? This enticing, fascinating woman. The enemies were afraid of him. The Philistines were afraid. She wasn't brazen as she was. She comes up to this, this spirit-anointed man, and yet foolish man, he couldn't discern this. I was horrified. I think it was Christmas Eve listening to the news at six o'clock and I like the fellow that gives the news there, what's his name, Peter, Peter Jennings. And he, he talked about the things, the folly of the past year. And he, he talked about uh, Gary Hart and a few others. And then he showed a painted doll. He said, this is Tammy May of PTL. She, she taught the nation how to make up. I thought that was rotten. And then you know what he said? He showed a picture of all Roberts like this. He said, all Roberts presented God as a terrorist. Could you think a spirit-filled man being accused of that? Presenting God as a terrorist? I borrowed Shakespeare's terms and say, he made God into a super Shylock. Give me, give me your money or I'll take your flesh. But these are holy men. Do you know... He, he did a terrible thing taking that million dollars. Do you know what he'd done before that? They were trying to get uh, uh, into uh, Oklahoma. They were trying to get uh, dog uh, uh, horse racing. Dog races. In Oklahoma? There, sir, 
house I think. You're off your horse just now. <laughs> he, t he saw Christ 900 feet high. That's a lie. He visualized him. Two men have seen Christ since the early days of the resurrection. One was Saul on the Damascus Road. Another was John on the Isle of Patmos. When fell at his feet as dead, I never saw the blazing majesty. I don't believe he ever recovered his eyesight. Physically, yes. Spiritually, he was blind to the world. That's why he became the most reckless man that's ever lived in the gospel. He out-preached everybody. He out-prayed everybody. He out-fasted everybody. And he made less money than anybody. He gives his back to the smiter. 195 lashes. Thrice, three times suffered shipwreck. Once he was stoned. And he does it all joyfully. He says, I glory in tribulation. Boy, if you three deacons like that in your church, you'd have a revival. <laughs> Glorying in tribulation, in necessities, in reproaches. We pray, oh God, I think I may lose a bit of money. People don't like me. Oh, are we howling God's prayer? He delighted in it. I believe that hell had a day's holiday when Paul died. He'd given them headaches so long. And they said, nobody will come up like him anymore. There have been so many in history like that. But Oral Roberts turned his back on the 900 foot Christ and this book says, talks about filthy lucre. And the filthiest filthy lucre is that that he got a million dollars worth of tear stained, beer stained, sin stained, uh, death stained dollars. And called it an answer to prayer. That's blasphemy. Yes. I'll tell you why Roberts failed. I'll tell you why PTL failed. Because both of those men were apostates. Now wait a minute. Uh, if you have G. Campbell Morgan's uh, wonderful expositions of Scripture, you should have them. They're $100 on sale for $39.95 right now. They're the best set of books, I think, almost there are, expositions. And in it he says, an apostate is not a man who continues to spread heresy. He's a man that came up to the true light and backed off from it. I heard Roberts preach in 1951 in, in, in Klamath Falls in South uh, Oregon. He preached that night on the fourth man. He tries to preach it now. It's an empty bag of wind. But that night when people came forward, he said, go straight past the platform into a room at the back, a tent at the back. And then he had over 2,000 people knelt down and prayed, Holy Ghost, come on these people. He said, the next 15 minutes is the most vital time in the life of these people. They're going to be born again of the Spirit of God. Let's pray them through. They never do that anymore. Become rich and increased in goods. You know, the Church of God has need of nothing today except the Holy Ghost, that's all. Amen. We've all the trimmings, we've all the show, we've all the fancy bits. But where is the power of the Spirit? Fasten me with green widths, I shall be as another man. Fasten me with new ropes, I shall be as another man. And what happened? He got nowhere. She got nowhere with him. You see, here's a man, he's a menace. He's quite a joker, isn't he? They put him up at the Holiday Inn, uh, which was built over the, as it is in some countries. Uh, you go up the, the pillars that hold the gates up, and he stayed up there somewhere, and in the night he couldn't sleep very well, so he got up and he carried the gates away, and the whole shebang. Put them at the top of the hill, I guess he said, well, it was easy for me to get them here, I guess you won't get them back as easy. So the city was upset, he, he upset them, he, he took the gates with him. So they got mad, so they sent 3,000 men after him. What did he do? He picked up the jawbone of an ass. That's a pretty humiliating weapon. Do you know what it was in his hand? Yes. Atomic weapon. One man against, was it two or 3,000? And he slew them. I heard of a, somebody in England where uh, a lady said, well, our pastor doesn't believe in that old fashioned stuff, you know, where the whales, where John has swallowed the whale. And he doesn't believe about that man, Samson. Uh, picking up the jawbone of an ass. He says, God doesn't use jawbones anymore. She said, he does at our church. <laughs> <coughs> the jawbone of an ass. Do you think hell trembled when he picked up that jawbone? Do you think the critics said, hey, that man's mad. We thought he was a lunatic. What's he going to do with it? Is it a souvenir? And he picks it up and he goes, boy, he might as well have had a two-edged sword. <coughs> Found me two-edged sword. The jawbone of an ass. 
in the hands of God is better than an atomic bomb in anybody else's hands. But you see, we, we can't trust God. We have so many gimmicks and gadgets and everything else. We think the only way to get revival is to raise funds and, and go to a city and pluck it out there. Let me tell you something. I may forget next week. Do you know what? Lots of evangelists, Graham admits many times, his crusades cost a million dollars. A million dollars and there's nothing left two weeks after. Holy Ghost revival doesn't cost a cent. Amen. Not one cent. It's not dependent on props. It's not appeal to the eye. It's when people go home and can't sleep for four or five nights. Do you know, when Spurgeon was in London, he was only 20 some, some years of age. Uh, I used to visit a lady, 95 years of age, and heard Spurgeon speak. Do you know the 20 years he was in London, he never once made an altar call? There are no altar calls in the New Testament. A dear pastor told me the other day, he came to see me yesterday, I guess, and he said, Sunday morning before I finished preaching, people were coming to the altar. I said, that's a sign of breathing of God. You see, we get an emotional little song at the end. There's room at the cross. And they come through emotion. Most of those people have been, to, they're altar tramps. They've come time after time after time. But to be born again is a miraculous thing. A man becomes a new creature. He has a new nature. He has new desires. He has a new vocabulary. He has new interests. Yes. All things pass away. Yes. They stink of the world. And if he's born, really born well, and he should be. After all, there are no cripples, no, nobody's born again blind. Nobody's born again lame. Every birth, new birth, is a new creation. And all heaven rejoices. Not when 10,000 people come to the altar, when one person comes. When one man wants to get rid of his sin and his lust, and he gets up and the psychologist can't help him and education can't and he comes out and he kneels at the cross and a miracle takes place all heaven goes into ecstasy you, you know when a baby comes in your home what a difference there is Spencer brought his presence she loves to hear me preach she's only about what three months old <laughs> so he brings her on but oh how delighted they were when they got that baby he and his precious wife and you know, that's why there's so little joy in the sanctuary. You can't say, you see, that man there a, a week ago was the worst man in town. I'll tell you how Mr. Chadwick got revival. He found out who was the most drunken, blaspheming, wicked man in town and the church concentrated. They said, look, we're going to pray for you to be born again. And he said, I don't know what you mean. I don't want to go to church. I'm not asking. Would you like to be a new man? Yes. Would you like a new vocabulary? Oh, I'm a profane. I'm, I'm a filthy speaker. If you get a new heart out of these issues of life, you become a new man, a new creation. You won't lust after the things of the world anymore. We're not getting people born like that. Churches are growing. Do you know why? The disgruntled go out of this church and join that church, that's all. The modern church is a cave of the dullum, where the debtors and all the bankrupt and others go. There's nobody robbing hell today. So what did she say? You see, it says this man was what? He was a what? It begins with N. Any Nazarenes here tonight? Oh no, they wouldn't come, but anyhow. <laughs> it says he was a Nazarite. There were three things a Nazarite, when he took a vow, one thing he couldn't touch anything that was dead. That's why he messed up and went back and touched the lion. He got into trouble that it killed. He, he can't touch anything dead it's a type of the world you hath he quickened to a dead in trespasses and in sin I'll bring that into my message next week about the evangelist side revival the dead were raised both physically and spiritually dead so number one he couldn't touch anything dead it was a, a type of those who were dead in trespasses and in sin uh, he couldn't drink wine which is a sign of worldly pleasure you know, most people would get rid of... I have a TV, I'll tell you that. When I, my boys have been on three different continents until a few weeks ago. I want to know the news. Good night, you know, don't know what's happened. Within an hour, never mind a day. But I like it for news. Uh, but worldly pleasure, no, I'm not interested. And once a person 
gets well. Wesley used to have his people sing, there's love and life and lasting joy, Lord Jesus found in thee. Again, a Christian's joy does not depend on happenings. Happenings depend on happenstance. Whether the weather's good or bad, the economy is good or bad. A man of Christ, Jesus says, I give you joy and no man taketh it from you. No man can steal your joy. Not even the devil can steal it. You give it up. Yes. A famous preacher sent a tract out recently and he said, the trouble with most of you, you've lost your first love. There isn't a scripture in the Bible that says that. You say it says that in Revelation. It doesn't say they lost their first love. It says you left your first love. That loyalty, that love you had for him, you're pouring it out to some idol on the TV maybe. Oh, that ball game, you get excited about it. Your neighbor's going to hell. It doesn't trouble you. God pity you. Why should the sinner weep for his sin if I don't weep for them? I have a little slip I put in some letters. If your preacher, if the, if your, uh, preacher doesn't weep over the pew, tell the pew to start weeping over the preacher. You see, I, I, it was about, well after midnight, I was in my office a few weeks ago. I was look, looking through... Uh, reading Revelation 20 and I suddenly stumbled on that verse there the second death and just like that I thought well I've been preaching 66 years I've been going to services for 75 I've preached around the world different groups I've never heard one's brother Bracey I've never once heard a sermon on the second death I've heard about the second coming I've heard about the second birth I've heard about the second blessing I've heard about the second Adam and there isn't one, it's the last Adam. But I've never heard a sermon on the second death. And just as a voice behind my chair, I turned my chair like that. And a voice said to me, hell has no exits. Ever think of that? A million roads into hell and not one out. Then last year, as I did last Saturday or Friday, I went to speak at Calvary Commission. I hope some of you support that, it's wonderful ministry, very godly little Pentecostal fellow, and he had al they'd allowed, I think, of eight or ten uh, parolees to come, and they came in the white suits and sat down, and as they did, boy, I just cracked up, because I remember God had said to me, hell has no exits. Then I looked at these men, and the voice said, hell has no parolees. Nobody gets a week off in hell. I understand Sing Sing Prison used to have order over the door. Abandon hope, all you enter here. Or was it Alcatraz, one of those two prisons? You see, in hell, do you know they pray in hell? But they're not heard. They're not heeded. There's no prayer in heaven because it's not needed. But it was in hell a man said, Oh, interfere, God, interfere. Don't let my brothers come to this place. You know, we've got this silly, stupid thing now. Uh, people trying to escape responsibility now. What the fellow, what's that fellow called? Sylvester Stallone and what's that stupid woman called? Oh, there's too many of them, but... Uh, <laughs> that stupid woman in Hollywood. Shirley MacLaine. Shirley Do you know what they say? Oh, I lived 300 years ago. My head was chopped off 300 years ago. Well, they prove that by the junk they talk about. <laughs> But the tragedy is this. Stallone says I was somebody, I was a, a knight or a king or somebody, and she has something else. I'd lived before. I'd love to talk with her and say, listen, you're not even living now. You may have a million in the bank. You may have the best mansion in Hollywood. You may have six Rolls Royces. You're not living now. You're dead. There's an area in you that's vacant, and only God can fill it. Popularity can't fill it. Fame can't fill it. Money can't fill it. Achievement can't fill it. It's a reserve in the being of every man where God wants to take up residence. A man isn't a Christian because he gives up lousy sins. I don't ask anybody if they're saved anymore. Everybody's saved from the White House to the jailhouse. I look them in the eye and say, Does Christ live in you? What? Well, the Bible says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, one of the curses in modern preaching is we leave people in, 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 uh, in Romans 7 as a cover-up for our own carnality. Yes. 
and we say Paul finished up in Romans 7 the mighty apostle finished saying it's not I but Christ that's a lie from hell he did not say that at the end of the train at the end of the train he said it's not I it's Christ living in me you can't have an indwelling devil and an indwelling Christ we get people to the cross that's not the problem it's getting them on the cross and then when you get on the cross the devil mocks you and says come down from the cross and save yourself pastor you don't need to fast while other pastors are feasting you don't need to pray while other pastors are playing well God's making you not then but you see every pastor should be a role model for the young people and I get some terrible calls about churches I don't ask the name I, but my cup of sorrow is filled to overflowing about the churches today they're so spiritually bankrupt he couldn't drink wine a sign of a worldly pleasure Wilkinson wrote an article in there about sipping saints and an awful lot of them these days too worldly pleasure they're lost you, you get preachers who can't I, I talked with a fellow not long ago who came in my office and I said well where are you going oh I'm going uh, duck hunting I said a few weeks no no months ago you went deer hunting three days deer hunting flying to a place three days duck hunting three days free. when did the last take nine days off to be alone with God yeah. you're afraid of the uh, stillness we're afraid of the stillness because it's then when God speaks he can't speak while that blurring radio TV is going on you get in the car as soon as you're in the car boy they turn the radio up and nearly blow your ears off our generation is afraid of stillness and yet he says be still and know that I'm God let me go back if you get bored get up and walk out Uh, let me just quote the scripture and, and go on to another one in the 13th chapter in verse 1 it says the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years there's a scripture I didn't look it up but isn't there a scripture that God says uh, I'll give them eyes but they won't see I'll speak but they won't hear I had a man came to see me last week a delightful guy he called me from a nearby town, 13 miles away, Linda. Brother Ray Miller, the Lord told me to come and see you. I thought, oh, another of them. I get these from all over the world. I said, well then, okay. And my wife was on the phone. She said, well, sir, if you take uh, number 16 road. He said, I don't have a car. I said, well, how did you get there? He said, I just dropped off the bus. I'd been on the bus three days and two nights from Fresno, California, just to talk with you if you talk with me two hours I'll be satisfied and that precious man came in and he says Mr. Raymond we're living in a terrible day I said sure I don't need confirmation in that and he said read the I think 23rd chapter of, of Jeremiah verse 13 where, where it says there are some running but I didn't send them there are some speaking but I didn't inform them and we've got guys all over the country I could give you a whole list of things that four or five years ago God wants us to do this they put millions of dollars in and they abandoned it right. they didn't refund the money and people that had money then have no money now I know at least two or three had the money in my office today worth stacks of money a few years ago my dear wife and I talked with a lady who at last year at this time was worth millions she hasn't a dime today a million dollar home won't sell it's having to go down to a terrible price and, and the, suddenly the world has shrunk so this little man comes boy he hadn't been in my office five minutes before I knew this man knew God he's an old type if ever you see one get hold of him and bring him to this church he's a curio he's called an old fashioned Pentecostal there aren't many left if you see one bring him even if you make him the janitor or the pastor but anyhow <coughs> He got talking about God and they talked about blessing it as though heaven opened the Lord came down. He said, Brother Raymond, I was pastor of a church for 14 years and in that 14 years not one person out of the church ever went to hospital. Isn't that a record? Because of his walk with God his wife walked out. Married a rich fellow then the daughter followed the, 
the mother. He sleeps in a tent on the hillsides in California. He said, I get two or three or four days with God. And then I moved my tent. He said, I'm here because God sent me. I said, I'm glad you came. And then he, t he told me not only about that. He said, you know, people weren't even sick in our church. And if somebody was sick, I would say, Brother Smith, pray for Sister Brown. I didn't leave it to me, lest they put a halo on my head. He said, I shared it. You pray for that person. You, we bore each other's burdens. Again, for 14 years, nobody ever went to hospital. A lady called him one day in panic. She said, oh, please come, please come. My baby's dead, my baby's dead. He couldn't get there for three hours, and the baby was lying as stiff as this. And he prayed over it and laid hands on it, the little thing sat up. He said, I didn't think that was phenomenal. You know, we say sometimes, Lord, we'd like to go back to Pentecost. Pentecost in the Bible is married to poverty, privations, pains, and prison. You want Pentecost like that? Do you think anybody's going to church where the pastor says, just before we sing this wonderful hymn, Holy, 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 I'm going to kill some hypocrites here. <laughs> the best known deacon and his wife, Mr. Ananias and Sapphira, who always wears the best clothes, you know, that's Pentecost. You know, one thing about the Pentecostal church in the Bible, it was unpredictable. Yeah. Now, we, we, we print orders to the Holy Ghost in the church office Wednesday yeah. and give them all a copy coming in at the door so the Holy Ghost goes home. Amen. Hang on to your shibboleths. Hang on to your outlines. Well, anyway, it says they've been in captivity for 40 years. That's a time of testing, as you know. Verse 25 says, The Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times. You see, this wasn't one, one thing. It, it was regular. It was intervals, but it was a regular operation. He more often had anointings than not have anointings. Now look at chapter 14 and verse 5. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards at Timnath and behold a young lion roared against him. The spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily and, and he rent it. What does the scripture say about the devil? He what? He's a what? So here you have a Holy Ghost filled man fa facing a physical lion. He doesn't run away, he doesn't send out a prayer letter. There's the demon, there's the lion. I, I've got to preach in... I don't go out preaching much. I came because I think the Lord wanted me to come with my precious brother, otherwise I won't be here. But the 17th, is it 17th? Well, 17th of, of January, I go to a church in, uh, uh, in Fort Worth called Common Ground Church. And the pastor said there'd be an awful lot of uh, young... He said, right across the road from us is the largest seminary or cemetery in the world. <laughs> Southwestern. So put a ring round that on your calendar, 17, and pray for the poor old boy as to go. I was going to say to say this. You know, some of those young men are itching to see old people, old guys like, uh, old guys, old brethren like uh, Dr. Criswell or somebody else. They're almost standing in line to jump in his pulpit. And, and they want to be esteemed. Oh, somebody said to one young, you're a second Billy Graham. He didn't sleep for a fortnight, I guess, after that. There's only one thing in this world I want. I've had plenty of honours, I've had plenty of uh, wonderful tags to my name there's one thing I, I still have an ambition you know the greatest thing in the world let me stop here a moment this man saw a lion he rent it the anointing came out. did he care about the, dead, the lion of course he didn't he ripped it as though a kid of the goats the greatest honour ever bestowed on any man apart from Jesus was put on the apostle Paul why because he cast demons out <laughs> 